Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Alicia Michelson, and I am the Artistic Director at Peninsula School of Art in Fish Creek, Wisconsin. I am honored to introduce our newest pair of artists in residence, Thomas McIntyre and Elise Krista Mishy. Thomas and Elise Krista are with us for a total of six weeks in an immersive studio experience that prioritizes time and space for them to engage fully in their creative practice, experiment, and pursue new projects and ideas. Today, we have the opportunity to get to know each of them and their work through brief image presentation. First, we'll hear from Thomas. Thomas McIntyre was born and raised in Virginia and now resides in Chicago, Illinois. In 2023, Thomas received a BFA with a concentration in architecture and sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. His practice is rooted in design and informed by craft techniques. These methodologies lead him into visceral material exploration, often culminating in ironic personified furniture objects. Thomas works between ceramic, metal, wood, and prefabricated industrial materials. There is particular attention paid to craftsmanship and function, as well as an interest in exaggerating utility to a place of absurdity. Take it away, Thomas. Hi, my name is Thomas McIntyre, and I'm excited to share my work with you today, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to spend time here at Peninsula School of Art. The first image is this first ceramic lamp I made while in school. Before creating this work, I'd spent a good amount of time taking architecture and design courses, but I was growing increasingly frustrated with the inability to actualize any of these ideas. Ceramics was so gratifying because the building process was so immediate. I was able to bring to reality these forms that I've been contemplating for so long. Forms that could be ambiguous in scale, shrinking or expanding to become furniture, sculpture, or even architectural. I explored these shapes through iterative sketching, sculpting the shape on the page before manifesting the form in clay. It felt intuitive that these ceramic objects should be lamps. I was interested in referencing the long history of ornate ceramic lighting. While it feels contrived to call these lamp objects ornate, I think there is undoubtedly a pursuit of imprecise ornamentation. I was interested in exploring decoration through this clunky hand-built texture and these overly saturated colors. In a way, creating this object that could almost be elegant if you were to zoom out and turn the saturation way down. This next project is a very early installation project I made in school. The piece was an outdoor installation on Lake Michigan. I don't like much about the work anymore, but this one shot I still enjoy, and I think there's a lot happening in this image that still excites me and exemplifies some of my continued interests. There is this pursuit to personify these inanimate objects and an overt conflation of the ready-made with natural materials. Later in my work, this conflation shifts to prefabricated with craft, but I can see in this early project my attempts at reaching this. Through this project, I also learned that I deeply enjoyed the labor involved in making. I spent weeks working in this area, moving large logs and chunks of cement stone, rolling timbers down the beach, and even floating and swimming pieces to this spot. This sculpture was an exploration into the properties of clay, as well as an investigation into this idea of implied functionality. The piece was never fired. I simply allowed the object to dry out slowly over time. And as it did so, the clay shrank around the items that had been inserted into it. I wrapped each object with some sort of malleable material so that as the piece shrank, the clay would grip the objects tighter instead of cracking around them. I utilized collected materials and recognizable industrial objects to create this utilitarian gadget that also felt like some sort of childish shrine. Moving forward, I started making more complex ceramic work, motivated by the challenges inherent with the material, but encouraged by the intuitive nature of building with clay. This chair is one of the largest ceramic pieces I've made. The form of the piece was inspired by a few different historical references, including 18th century birthing chairs and Victorian clawfoot furniture. In the process of building, the object shifts from animalistic at the base to become more and more humanoid, and the seat responds to the human form, creating a surprisingly comfortable 
an ergonomic seat that supports various orientations of sitting. Then the piece is wrapped in this layered grid pattern, warping and emphasizing the form. I am continually drawn to plaids and tartans because of their domestic familiarity, but also because of their ability to signify so many different things. So these pieces were created at the same time and kind of became this incidental vignette. The ceramic chair was yet another technical challenge for myself utilizing more slab building techniques this time and working towards a very specific design. The proportions were informed by a toilet, which I found to be a humorous but unavoidable reference when making ceramic furniture. The wobbly figure that makes up the back of the seat was inspired by the wiggly scale figure I used to draw when making architectural drawings. The grid motif comes up yet again, this time also operating as a reference to the graph paper used in architectural planning. The floor lamp is constructed of powder-coated forged steel components that can be reassembled into different arrangements and heights, shrinking or expanding to fit whatever environment it might find itself in. Like a heavy piece of machinery, the lamp spreads its legs for stability. With this object, I wanted to pursue some of my earlier ideas about combining prefabricated materials with handcrafted elements. I think it is this conflation of craft with the ready-made where exciting aesthetic developments occur and materials and processes are recontextualized. This next work I wanna talk about is from my undergraduate thesis show. I had a small room where I constructed this installation of furniture objects that I made over the previous couple of years. The title of the space was Breezeway Jamboree. This liminal space explored the intersection of interior and exterior, celebrating architectural transition, a space of casual interaction and home to precious and utilitarian objects alike. The furniture was posed as characters taking part in these unceremonious exchanges. A peg rail inspired by Shaker traditions was used as an organizational device for the space. All of the lamp cords were stored on this wall, hanging from hand-forged hooks. This table is suspended from the peg rail as if to lift it out of the way for cleaning or to honor the object more thoroughly. The next image shows a few more of the objects that inhabited this space and the foam padding that covered the floor. This padding granted a feeling of comfort while implying a notion of utility. The objects in the room each possess varying degrees of humanoid and animalistic qualities, implying a lively gathering. The competing gridded patterns carry their own fictional histories. So this is a more recent piece I made. Um, I began this series of Ottoman objects based off traditional antique quilt racks. The idea originated from observing the quilt racks my grandparents had in their home and the niche function that these objects provided. I was interested in creating an object that could house these sacred textiles or even just store remnant materials while also providing a utility beyond storage. This object, in addition to serving its true cause as a storage and display device, can also operate as an ottoman or footstool. The piece is malleable in its width to accommodate various sizes of textiles or remnants, and this iteration aims to elevate even mundane scrap material to a level of reverence. Once again, utilizing this ambiguous but multifunctional design, I created a new iteration of my Ottoman quilt rack. I was interested in exploring this design with a new material palette that shifts the character of the piece and explores more mundane and industrial materials. There is still a pursuit of decoration, but through the celebration of unique joinery and fastening methods. The restricted palette allows the textile to become a more central focus and the beefy construction encourages interaction. When dismantled, the object can stow away almost flat, alleviating its spatial burden if its textiles are in use. Going forward, I plan to make more versions of this design, exploring new materials and ideas of functionality. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thomas. Next up, Elise Krista Mishi. Elise Krista is an artist, funeral professional, and creative thanatologist residing in Appleton, Wisconsin. 
through multidisciplinary creative practices, thanatological research, and interactions with people and place, Elise Krista gains insight into personal and collective existential issues. She holds a BA in studio art from Lawrence University, an MS in thanatology from Marion University, a dementia specialist designation from UW Oshkosh, is a certified time slips facilitator and chairperson of the Appleton Public Arts Committee. In partnership with the Trout Museum of Art, Elise Krista founded Farewell Art and Death Cafe, a creative death education and resourcing program she facilitates on behalf of her community. Let's hear from Elise Krista. Hello, I am Elise Krista and I am delighted to share my work with you today. So let's begin here with the weighing of time, an almost decade old piece that I believe highlights my interdisciplinary approach to art making and my nesting into the routine of using creativity as a tool to explore and express existential ideas. As an essential uh, component of human development, creativity is a psychological, cognitive, and a behavioral process that I believe influences how people interact with both their internal and external worlds. Through a collective and historical lens, since the beginning of humankind, people worldwide have employed the innate, but not always used, uh, and evolutionary superpower of creativity as a tool to understand, manage, and reimagine the unknowns of both life and death. Indeed, the word creativity itself means to bring something new into being or to make grow. Within my own work as seen in this piece here, The Weighing of Time, which I deem a live drawing or a 3D enactment of a 2D illustration or flat concept, I am interacting with both introspective and extrospective versions of myself through makeshift double exposure to not only counter feelings of wasting time, but to also grow my understanding of what it means to spend time within a life of limited time, which means that I tend to both obviously and subtly pack a lot into my artwork through use of creative practices that preserve a sense of my childhood and personal memory, that elevate childhood craft and the concept of play as fine art forms. Yes, I and passionately in support of hot glue and make believe as uh, <laughs> fine art forms, as well as through observations and interactions with people and place that open space for deep and meaningful conversations. So these latch trip pieces, they're also embroidered mixed media drawings. They were made as a means to process a loss, to preserve a memory and to better understand the end of life and afterlife experiences of uh, someone in my life. So a few days before my friend and grandpa figure, Tom, died, we were alone when he turned to me and he said, EK, you'll get a kick out of this. I have been going to a red place and I don't know if I like it very much, but if I close my eyes, I can go to other places and reality is becoming less and less. To this day, I thank Tom for this gift of conversation that opened my mind and my creative practice. Indeed, research shows that our minds can breach the limits of preconceived boundaries at end of life. And this is a state that I seek to replicate in my life. I consider my art practice to be holistic in nature, encompassing mind, body, and spirit, or in the case of this work here, it encompasses soul and soul soul interaction. This is an interactive viewing vessel uh, motivated by the idea that bodies are temporary homes for our souls. In approach to this grand paper mache container, the viewer stands on the step stool to peer through the peephole which is actually an old uh, hotel people that my, my dad gifted me. Inside there is a mirror box pointing towards a looped video 
soul cycle. The video appears as though it is far off into the distance, sort of obscured by the mere fractals, and the viewer sneaks a peek of a soul in action with consideration to who, what, where, when, and why, and how a soul might be. Diverse systems of spiritual and religious belief honor the soul, while research within neuroscience explores how energy outlives death. And you can continue watching this video at your own leisure through the link that I believe is, is set up there as well. Over time, my creative practice and research incorporated the goal to reimagine death through acts of memorial, ritual, and with archetypes such as birds, which are indeed the most universal and historical symbol of a connection between this world or life and another world or afterlife. Birds also reflect a fundamental aspect of human nature, the denial of death as finality through desire for renewal. Right, we, we want to keep living if we can. Uh, and transformation and rebirth, right? Those are also kind of concepts that we hope for. Birds are also phenomenal creatures that inspire us by their ability to reach beyond human feats. So this piece, the offering, reaches new feats by saying, please do touch the art. Viewers are welcome to walk on the rug and make a flower offering to the bird man of life and or death. Importantly, I must note, you can only or should only touch artwork if permissed clearly by somebody. Some artwork is not meant to be touched. Encouraging people to interact directly with the work that I make though, through meditative processes, empowers individuals to approach challenging topics with a sense of control over the uncontrollable. Importantly, my artwork honors life and death and hopefully makes both more approachable, less daunting, and more beautiful or, or at least less heavy of a topic to be able to approach with others or ourselves, right? <laughs> we often inhibit our, our own selves to going down a, a route for various reasons. My goal of art is to provide an open book of sorts for people to be inspired to explore what concepts of, of death or existence in general mean for themselves and how they can use art to talk about the good and the not so good parts of lives with me, with themselves, and with others in their life. Many of my previous residencies and projects have been conversation focused many of them happening at nursing homes or with older adults, with the goal to provide a safe place for people to share parts of their lives, their fears or memories that they may not always feel welcome to share. Through some of these conversations or reminiscing sessions, uh, which are visually documented in this here series, Mementos, I have learned about the objects that older adults or other people cherish the life stories that they tell, the history they hold, and how these objects will eventually outlive them or us as mementos of existence. Edwin Schneidman, a now deceased but lovely thanatologist, renowned for his musings and research, coined the term post-self, which is the idea that we can live on in life after death through the objects, people, memories, and other contributions we leave behind. Thinking about these concepts even more so in 2020, while I was volunteering in hospice, working as a nursing assistant and bed tech um, in hospice and at a nursing home, and you know, just the whole of 2020, I began the journey of becoming a thanatologist. Thanatology is the scientific study of death, dying, grief, and loss, and how people cope with these life events. It examines death and other losses that are not death-related from a variety of perspectives, 
um, including the physical, psychological, ethical, spiritual, sociological, medical, etc. Or in simpler terms, thanatology is the study of life with death left in. And the goal is to make death and other hard conversations more nor normalized within our um, own minds and in the minds of communities and greater society. So over the next few years, my creative practice would de decrease <laughs> in output, but tenfold in intake of knowledge and inspiration as I worked through my degree. I also started spending a lot more time in cemeteries, which research does, research does show um, are indeed frequently used for recreation. While recreating or walking through graveyards, I like to look at the images and sayings on gravestones. They tell a lot about a culture, a family, an individual, and how they remember or want to be remembered visually. And there's also oftentimes a lot of sentiment or spirituality and even humor within these pieces. So if you live in Door County, you may see me pursuing local cemeteries during my time in residence, expanding on these series. And yes, you are more than welcome to walk with me. Now, in more recent years, I continue to expand creatively and professionally. I work for a funeral home as a funeral ambassador, a creator of uh, printed funeral service products, fill-in admin, and I also get to drive the coach, or better known as the hearse, to services and cemeteries. At one graveside service recently, a live guest pointed his own grave out to me, sharing that he visits it very frequently and he feels a sense of comfort and peace knowing that it is where he will one day rest. This piece here, an imminent reflection, Blossoms Bloom Regarding a Lifetime, embodies the softness this person shared with me regarding his reflection on the inevitable of non-existence, how by reflecting on where we have been, where we are, and where we are going in life and death can spur a life review and I think a reprioritization that allows us to find a little more individual and collective softness amidst the sharpness of our lives. At the very least, um, considering this piece, we can be a shadow or a reflection that continues on in the memories, memorials, or other ways we ourselves and others honor and remember. I do think about all of these concepts a lot of how life is lived on a spectrum of soft and sharp, of remembering of other worlds or realities about afterlives and uh, I have come to terms with the fact that I am just too curious to have a definitive answer of exactly what happens after death, if anything besides just death. This curiosity actually is what allows me to engage in a dual process of oscillating between deep work and play, as seen in my recent affinity towards work driven by thanatological research and often dumpster dove or reclaimed quirky materials laden with memory. As seen in this piece here, birds gather beyond the visible sky, which employs a nail and string process that my dad taught me when I was seven, coupled with a simultaneous memory of my first ER visit. On a sweeter note, I also, uh, as seen here, happily eat a lot of chocolate for the gold foil which I used as gold leaf on the leaves. I repurpose broken cassette tapes to use as string. And I cut wood on the squirrel saw I inherited from a deceased loved one. All the while, considering that perhaps afterlife is a shiny black hole where people are greeted by the silent but beautiful song of red birds. This all being said, Using different mediums and processes helps me to be receptive, to be on the ready to explore my own and others' ideas in a variety of ways for more opportunity to see life and death from all sides, from different views. I like to say that we know what it means to exist. 
some days I think more than others, right? But we can only imagine what it is to not exist. Importantly, I am to a place now in my own existence here on earth where I understand that finding meaning in death is also about finding meaning, purpose, and joy in life. For me, I find all of these things in the legacy I build for myself and at the intersection between death education and creative engagement. While engaging creatively with others recently over existential conversation at my Farewell Art and Death Cafe program, someone mentioned how hard it can be to remember all of the goodness we have had and have in our lives, especially amidst loss, be it the death of a loved one or a living loss, like the loss of a job or the loss of a hope or dream. Therefore, I choose to end on this piece, forget me not, because it represents where I'm headed next in my practice, to the land of memory, to capture the goodness within my life and the lives of those around me. I have a jar of wisdoms collected from others, a studio full of meaningful junk, and a box of chocolates, in addition to this residency's gift of time to launch me into the next chapter of my artwork. So that is all I have for today. Thank you very kindly for your time and attention. I appreciate you. Thank you to both Elise Krista and Thomas for sharing more about their work and research. If you are tuning in from the Fish Creek area, please join us in person for an open studio event with both artists on December 10th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Between now and then, keep an eye on our social media for more on these artists. Thanks so much. See you next time.